Welcome to this introduction to proteins. The first thing to know about proteins is that our bodies are partly built from protein. In fact, I would say largely built from protein and of course water. A class of proteins known as enzymes make life possible by steering the chemical reactions happening every second in every cell of our body. In that respect, proteins could be said to make up the machinery of our cells. Proteins also make up much of the structure of our bodies. They're the key part of our bones, muscles, tendons, ligaments, and organs. Proteins are also the basis of many hormones and neurotransmitters. In other words, the chemicals that allow one part of our body to communicate with and regulate other parts. Our bodies don't store protein. The proteins in our bodies are in use unless we've just eaten them. So although our bodies can convert protein into energy, that really isn't what proteins are good for. You'll find protein in varying amounts in all whole foods because plants and animals use them in much the same way we do. In fact, as we are made up of protein, so are plants and animals. These foods here all contain a decent amount of protein by dry weight, but we don't generally eat foods dry. When cooked, animal foods such as meat, fish, seafood, poultry, offal, eggs and dairy tend to contain the highest proportions of proteins. Among plant foods, Beans, legumes, nuts, seeds, and meat substitutes like tofu are the highest in protein. You may read that certain vegetables like spinach and broccoli are particularly high in protein, but this is true only relative to their dry weight. And of course, most vegetables are largely water. The plant-based foods that are rich in protein in practical terms are the nuts, seeds, beans, and lentils, legumes. The supposed benefits and harms of protein in our diet frequently make the nutrition headlines, so it pays to know a little bit about this essential part of food. Proteins are made up of amino acids, much like a Lego construction is made up of Lego pieces. When our digestion is working as it should, the protein we eat is broken down to its amino acid building blocks in our stomach and intestines, and then absorbed into our bodies, which then of course uses these amino acids to build our own proteins. Although it isn't important to know all the names of the amino acids and all the chemical details, understanding a little bit about the different types of amino acids is necessary to make sense of everything from food advertising to protein supplements. One way of dividing up amino acids is by their essentiality. Nutritionists consider a nutrient, in this case an amino acid, to be essential when our body cannot make it from something else in our diet. If our bodies need something, but can't make it from something else, it is essential, as in it needs essentially needs to be in the diet. Non-amino acids are considered essential. A non-essential amino acid is one that, if necessary, our body can make by rearranging one of the essential ones. And a conditionally essential amino acid is one that becomes essential, meets that criteria, in certain people under certain circumstances. And you can see here that there are several of these. In practice, it's better to get a good supply of all the amino acids in the diet, but at least now if you read the term essential amino acid, you know roughly what it means. A complete protein, sometimes also called a whole protein, is a protein that provides all the essential amino acids in roughly the right proportion for our needs. An incomplete protein is one where some amino acids are low. They're basically not in the right proportions. Many animal proteins tend to be complete. It isn't necessary to get all our amino acids from one source though, so the right combinations of incomplete proteins will still result in covering all our bases. The classic example is combining beans and rice. Just to clarify, an incomplete protein isn't so much lacking the essential amino acids, it just doesn't have them in the optimal proportions that we need. The key message here is that although some sources of protein are more complete than others, as long as everything we eat combines to give us what we need, we'll get what we need. Not all proteins are well digested, and what we can't digest, our bodies can't use. So beyond defining proteins as complete or incomplete, there are systems for rating the quality of protein. The approaches to rate protein vary in detail, but basically try to rate the protein based not only on whether it's complete, so what amino acids it has and in what ratio, but also how well we're able to digest and therefore use it. Unsurprisingly, animal proteins from meat, fish, seafood, poultry, dairy, and eggs tend to score high because they are complete and they are in the form we need. Animals are, after all, a lot closer to our biology than our plants. 
Some plant-based proteins also score highly, particularly pea and soy proteins. In practice, you would need to eat more of a lower quality protein to meet your needs than you would of a higher quality protein. But if you follow the recommendations at the end of this module, it really won't matter that much. Most of the amino acids you get from the breakdown of protein in your diet go toward building your own proteins and other substances built on amino acids such as hormones and neurotransmitters. When needed, our bodies can convert amino acids into glucose via a process known as gluconeogenesis or the making genesis of new neoglucose, hence gluco. As our bodies don't have a way of storing excess amino acids, surplus can also be converted into fat. Although this isn't the easiest thing for our body to do and it usually doesn't happen to any large degree. Here's a bonus, and if you forget the details it won't change your ability to understand nutrition much, but it is interesting and maybe useful if you're looking at ways to improve your mood and or concentration for example. So in addition to amino acids being the building blocks of proteins, they are also the foundation of some neurotransmitters. These are chemical messengers essential to the working of our nervous system, and the target of medications designed to help with mood, concentration and pain. For example, the amino acid phenylalanine can be converted to tyrosine, another amino acid, by our bodies. Tyrosine is the building block for dopamine, adrenaline, and noradrenaline if you're from the US, epinephrine and norepinephrine. In practical terms, having extra tyrosine may help with alertness and concentration. That said, as tyrosine is also the precursor for the thyroid hormones thyroxin and triiodothyronin, it's best to avoid tyrosine supplementation if you have a thyroid condition. Or only do so under medical supervision. The amino acid tryptophan is the building block for serotonin, the neurotransmitter that is often the target of medication used to treat depression and anxiety. Serotonin in turn is the building block of melatonin, which is basically our sleep hormone causing us to become drowsy and lower our body temperature and basically prepare us for sleep at night. Having extra tryptophan may help with mood, but it can also interfere with medication, especially antidepressants and also sleep medication. So consult your doctor before considering tryptophan supplements. The amino acid glutamine can be converted to the amino acid glutamate, which itself acts as a neurotransmitter, and which can be converted to the neurotransmitter gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA for short. This is interesting because medications that mimic or enhance the effects of GABA are sometimes used in the treatment of seizures, restless leg syndrome, and chronic pain conditions. Unfortunately, there really isn't enough research to say that taking glutamine will help with these problems. If you're thinking about trying supplemental glutamine and are on any medication, let your doctor know. Lastly, although a protein meal will stimulate the release of insulin by the pancreas, proteins high in the amino acid leucine are particularly potent which can be desirable if you want the anabolic or muscle building effect of insulin. To recap, there is no storage organ for protein, so excess protein has to be converted to either glucose, fat, or ketones. Also, different amino acids have different fates. For example, some can be converted to glucose, others to ketones, and others can go either way. That brings us to some questions I suspect you have, like how much protein, when, and what are good sources of protein? Answers in nutrition seldom come this easy, but the vast majority of people will do well on between 1 and 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. That's roughly half a gram to 1 gram of protein per pound of body weight, if you prefer to think in pounds. This is a bit higher than in some recommendations, but it's entirely consistent with research highlighting the benefits of a modestly higher protein diet. A good proportion of protein in a meal will also help you feel fuller. It tends to, and people vary on this, provide a bit more satiety than fat or carbohydrate. Also, the more you restrict your diet in terms of calories or energy, the more important it is to be on the high side of this range to help conserve your muscle and organs. If you're recovering from an injury or doing regular exercise, then err on the higher side of the 1 to 2 grams per kilogram of body weight range. Going higher still is unlikely to cause problems unless you have a kidney disease. Going somewhat higher is unlikely to cause problems unless you have a kidney disease, and it seems like going very low is unhelpful. So err on the side of getting enough. When should you eat protein is another easy one. Try and have protein with every meal and snack that you have. A little more protein in the meal or snack following exercise, as that is when your body is best at getting protein into muscles, will help you recover. If you're intentionally keeping your calories low, think about adding a high protein snack, 
so that your body gets a fresh supply of protein every three or so hours during your eating window. So I'm not suggesting you have to have midnight snacks and so on, but during your eating window, have protein on a fairly regular basis. There are a few reasons for protein with every meal. One is that protein is more likely to help you feel full or satisfied. Another is that protein in a meal can help your body to control blood glucose, something we'll get into a little bit in future modules. Lastly, regular protein helps you flip on a switch that makes healing and recovery easier. We really covered this near the start, so I'll expand a few things. Protein from meat gets a lot of bad press, and some good press too. Unfortunately, it's very hard to tease apart the effect of specific proteins in meat from other things that may be in meat as well, which will depend on how the animal is farmed and even how it's processed. Meat certainly contain high quality protein, but opt for grass fed, preferably organically grown meat, to minimize the health downside and maximize the health benefits. Also go for minimally processed meat, as turning meat into meat products tends to involve adding quite a few ingredients and not all of them are good for health. The same applies to eggs. Get organic if you can, preferably go for pastured, which means that the chickens have been fed a diet consistent with what they would eat in the wild, as opposed to a diet made up predominantly or exclusively of grains. Now whether you or not you opt to include meat or indeed any animal products in your diet, aim to get your protein from a wide variety of sources. Include some nuts, seeds, beans and lentils, all of course depending on your preferences and tolerances. If you opt for vegan, so no animal product approach, you may be different from using a vegan protein powder such as pea protein. To slightly increase your intake of high quality plant based proteins without needing to have a large amount of beans and lentils all the time. Opting for organically grown will make limited difference to the protein quality and likely only a modest difference to the protein quantity, but it will make a big difference to what else is in the food you eat. So if you have the option, consider it a worthwhile investment in your health.